I asked Marish a little bit about his presentation, and uh, and he said there's some secret because it's a very hard things, and he will uh, show us a very very hard cases. So Marish, you can start. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for a nice introduction. Um, hello, hello everyone. Uh, are you tired after two days conference? Hmm? Not really. So uh, my name is Marius Gil. Uh, today I would like to show you uh, some basic stuff about the machine learning, uh, what the machine learning is, and how we can use the machine learning techniques in our projects. I'll demonstrate some some cases we had in uh, in last projects. Maybe the techniques I show you will be useful uh, in, in in your project. Uh, I'm a professional developer since 2000, so I'm, my career is mostly involved with uh, Java, Python, and some uh, dynamic language like PHP, Ruby, or Python. And right now, I'm mostly involved in some web applications, uh, mostly written in, in PHP and, and uh, in Python. So. Uh, Right after this conference, we have the meetup for our uh, for our PHP uh, community with some Docker stuff and uh, the, the the performance testing. If you are interested and still hungry for knowledge, you can uh, apply for for our uh, meetups. And I run my own personal company, Source Ministry, where we are using uh, the machine learning techniques uh, in different projects. So I would like to start from uh, from the real problem. Um, a couple of years ago, one of our clients had a very popular uh, woman website. It was in uh, top three from the um, mega panel um, inquiry. And one day he realized that there was a huge problem. Almost all the traffic from the website disappeared in a few hours. And after that, the money from, <laughs> from the traffic also disappeared. So. My client uh, started an investigation, what's going on, and after a few hours, they realized that someone created a lot of toxic link, a lot of toxic link, and because there is some, a lot of toxic link to, to point in, uh, to his website, the leading search engine punished his website and all the links from the index disappear. So uh, my client contact with uh, client support from the leading uh, search engine and was asked for providing a CSV file with links to removed to be removed from the from the index and it was a very popular website there was millions of backlinks so try to imagine how hard this 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 was so um, to introduce a little bit more this this case. Try to imagine, you've got the CSV file with one million of links, one million. The real case was about 10 millions, but for some simplification, you can imagine that we've got only one million of black links. And all you need to do is split the single file with one million of links into three groups. The first groups contains a links, which, uh, which are okay, and you would like to have links uh, from this group to your website. And the second group is uh, links uh, which are toxic and you definitely don't want links from this group. And there is a, probably another group, third one, where you don't, you, you, you don't care about these links. So for example, if, oh sorry, uh, if, you are, uh, if you have a link from the uh, Onnet website or any very popular with huge page rank uh, website, yeah, this is a link you would like to have to your website because this is a good linking. Uh, from the other side, maybe you probably don't want to have a link from this website. This is a, a spammer website, a lot of links, and this website was created only for something like Black SEO technique and things like that. And the, the, the task is, what do you think? Task is easy or hard? Just split single file into three files. But the, um, what is the criteria for selecting the links between uh, three, three different groups, right? This is a little bit complicated. Okay, if you think that this case is very uh, <laughs> artificial, remember this situation. 
a couple years ago, the leading comparison software called Knockout has extracted exactly the same situation. Uh, he, he was uh, punished <laughs> one more time by the same leading uh, search engine, and most of the links from the search index was disappeared. And the initial public offer was cancelled because there was a huge, uh, huge problem in the finance. So uh, our idea was because you can compare links itself. It's, 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 a, it's a text. You don't see what is the, the, the on the page behind this link. So we started from small transformation. We had to transform every single list, every single links from this list into the vector of the numbers. And because the numbers are, uh, are something we can compare. We can compare the vectors, but we can compare the, the, the text itself. So we started to think what we can collect from every single URL into the form on the, on the, on the, on the numbers. So we implemented a small application who are able to perform this task. And then our client said, OK, if you provide me a CSV or Excel file with these vectors, I probably will be able to prepare an Excel formula or things like that to transform all these vectors, all this number in single vector. These parameters are called features in machine learning uh, industry to provide only one information. Let's say one, uh, zero, one to three, where, where zero is a link, uh, a good one link, and the uh, three or two is a, is an extremely bad link. So this is an example of algorithm called principal component analysis, where every, uh, where very complex set of the features are transformed into the small subset of new features principal component analysis. This is one of machine learning tasks. And our client said he will be probably able to perform itself. And we prepared this. And uh, because the first version of this application, uh, our first approach just for proof of concept was, OK, we can create this, this link. We can, create, we, we can implement this formula created by our client and his analysis. And even we can prepare an ethology in the code. This was the first approach, and we create this this uh, this this, uh, this Excel file, provided to the client, and after a couple of days, client said, "Hmm, it's it's rather hard to say how to compare these numbers, and to be honest, I don't know how to perform it." So uh, we asked client for a couple of week extra time, because we s it was a couple of years ago. So. Uh, we started to think about the machine learning. The machine learning was uh, extremely buzzword uh, then. <laughs> Today, there's uh, exactly the same situation. And we started thinking how we can apply the machine learning to solve this, this particular case. How to use machine learning to split this file into three subsets. And our second approach was the naive machine learning approach. Why the naive? Because to be honest, we didn't know anything about the machine learning. <laughs> okay, we've got the, we, we've got the, uh, the we had the, um, a library for the machine learning. We had the data, so we can create a model and classify our data and to make our our client happy, right? So, um, so our idea was okay. We've got the data, we've got the machine learning task. This is a classification. So. If we got the data, if we've got the data, and we can create a model, so we can create a result, and unfortunately, it was a, it was a very problematic, because our our solution was heavily inspired by two books, yeah, uh, copy and pasting from Stack Overflow, because we didn't anything, uh, we didn't know anything about the about the machine learning, so we're trying to stuff until it works, <laughs> so. So this is the first advice in machine learning world. If you don't know how it works, it's a recipe for the failure. So sometimes, if you need to perform some machine learning task, you need to know exactly what kind of task you need to perform and how to prepare your data. In our scenario, the machine learning algorithm was OK, but the everything around the machine learning process was extremely uh, badly dead. So the machine learning is not, it's not only a code. So uh, 
then we started to thinking how we can um, apply a better approach because our second solution was working perfectly on uh, on our training data sets but in the real world the accuracy and the performance of this uh, of the solution was uh, something like that <laughs> the client decided to not use it um, so we started to thinking how we can um, do it better and with with after a few, few, few weeks, we finished with data-oriented machine learning workflow. And the workflow is a keyword, because machine learning is not only the running the algorithm. So uh, let's start thinking what the machine learning is. So if you run a Wikipedia, you will see this definition. And you can, th the computer program is set to learn from experience E, with respect of some class of task T and performance measure P, if its performance in task in T in as measured by P improve with experience. So we've got three different elements here. We've got the task, we've got the experience, I mean the data, and we've got the performance measure. We need to measure how our algorithm performs to improve in future. So uh, this definition in the terms in, in graphics could be presented this way. We've got the data, and this data maybe some, after some, some preparation should be injected into the machine learning task where the model will be trained, validated, self-validated, and, and cross-validated. Then with some performance measure, we can observe the result. And then, this is machine learning, so it can be it proved. So if decision made by the, the software is wrong and some, someone, like, like uh, let's say the user, change decision from your software, this decision could be injected and should be injected in your, the data set for another generation of your model. In the, in the, uh, in the project I mentioned with links, uh, we had 40 different iterations for creating a model because every single iteration uh, was a little bit better because we've got a bad decisions from the software fixed by the, by, the, by the users. And sometimes we need to decide which user decision is okay and which uh, decision is, is not okay because uh, some situation the user can be wrong. Not every particular decision made by user is okay. <clears throat> so we started, before we injected new data into our data set, we compared decisions, the same decision made by different users. And if majority of the users was okay, okay, this data was injected. So what kind of task machine learning can solve for us? For example, some classification task, when you've got a lot of different objects and you need to classify like this, this, this case with the links. We need to classify every single, uh, every single link into the three classes. Okay, not okay, I don't care. Sometimes you would like to predict some continuous values. For example, <coughs> if you know what is the level of the cloud today, what is the humidity, and uh, what is the temperature above the ground, you may be able to, to predict what is the temperature of the air, for example. Machine learning can also solve some clustering task. For example, <coughs> some clothing uh, companies are using clustering algorithms to detect what kind of uh, sizes of the clothes should be should be sell on, on different markets. For example, if this market has a cluster user with uh, 3x huge. Sometimes you would like to use a machine learning task for dim dimensionality reduction. The PCA, the principal component analysis, the algorithm I mentioned, this is an example for the dimensionality reduction algorithm. You've got the set of, let's say you've got the vector with 100 elements and you would like to visualize it. It's a little bit tricky, right? You can't visualize something with uh, 100 dimensions. But you can apply the PCA algorithm, for example, to reduce dimensionality. You can compress 100 dimensions into the toe, and then you can create a chart. 
If you are working with some uh, analytics team, these algorithms may be extremely useful. And finally, for example, you can use association rules to, to find an automatic way uh, rules from your data. That means, okay, this parameter is high. Let's say uh, this, this user uh, makes a lot of money so, uh, about a lot of products in our state. What, the, what are the rules behind this particular uh, case? There are some algorithms behind this. <coughs> For some algorithms, you can use different learning methods like supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. Sorry. What does it mean that learning is supervised? You've got the input data set. For example, in our scenario, an input data set was the vectors of the numbers for every single in, uh, links. Not links itself, but the vector of the numbers for every single link. And then, this is the input file, and then you've got the output, outcome for your algorithm created, for example, by human. For every single link, we know, because it was classified by the human, it's a good link, bad link, or I don't care. During the supervised learning method, the algorithm will able to find a correlation between the input and the output file to create a model. And then, finally, you can ask this model for the new data, which are unknown for this model. Okay, for some unsupervised learning, it's very, <laughs> very similar. That you, you've got the only, you've got the only input part, and the outcome is unknown. And then, automat the, the algorithm will be able to find the result. Different algorithms use different techniques, and uh, <coughs> sometimes you need to tune every single algorithm a little bit. So, what does it reinform reinforcement learning? Sometimes the machine learning, <coughs> the machine learning model, uh, can apply decision, and then check result from the environment. Okay. For example, imagine you are learning a robot uh, who who will be uh, walking on the line, and then if the ro if this robot moves the center of gravity this way, he will fall. So this is a reinforcement learning. The decision you made, I mean that the, the center of gravity was moved, it was a wrong decision. Okay. Don't try use this technique to learn your car right. <laughs> because decision, if you hit the tree, okay, it was wrong decision. It was a little bit problematic. <laughs> so uh, different scenario, different example. Uh, try to imagine that we've got the data set single CSV file, text file, with some information about the developers. Like this one. We've got the information about the age, and we've got the information about number of the confirmations, let's say, in C++ from the LinkedIn. And then we've got the salary. And we would like to create a machine learning model to predict salary based on age and LinkedIn C++ confirmation. If we would like to, to create the project for this small set, this is a regression problem, by the way. So this is, we would like to predict values, predict a value based on some elements. So uh, let's say we, we, we can ask the question, how many euro I should earn as a developer according to my skill set. And my skill set is presented as a vector of the numbers. OK, for example, for example yeah, okay, let's start from this case. If you are a Python developer, this is an example for fantastical, uh, fantastic uh, library called Scikit. Scikit is a set of uh, uh, set, set of libraries where where very interesting algorithms for all the machine learning tasks are already implemented. Because believe me, today as a developer, you don't need to write every single machine learning on your own. All you need to do is use prepared the algorithm and build everything around it. The, all you need to know, the, 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 the machine learning we know, <coughs> I mean that you need to find a correlation between the input and the output is this single line. And this single line. The model is created and data, data is fitted uh, from between the, the, the input and output. That's all. So where is the, 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 where the issue with the machine learning? 
if I can create a machine learning model with two lines of code, with ah, maybe with some imports. So why is it so hard? Oh, okay, in this, in this scenario, you see some, some uh, random data generated. If you plot this data, you will see something like that, probably. We've got some points. Let's say this is the age, this is the number of uh, <laughs> number of the of the, of the confirmations from LinkedIn, and we've got the two machine learning models prepared: one with linear regression, the blue line, and uh, green line is an isotonic regression. And you see a very typical two problems with machine learning: the blue line is uh, underfitted. I mean, in this part, the result will be not so good. And this isotonic, okay, it's a little bit probably overfitted, I think. Maybe in this scenario, a different, uh, different regression model like polynomial, let's say it, it should be something like that, will be better. Why this is important? Because we didn't analyze our data before. And if you don't know your data set, if you don't know your data at all, it's another, it's a recipe for the failure. Because the first step in machine learning project is UDF, not user-defined function. It's an understate data first approach. You need to analyze your data. You need to know everything about your data. For example, if you've got some um, statistical background, you can create, a, you can perform an exploratory analysis. You can create some scatter plots to see the maybe there are some, some non correlation in your data. Maybe you will see that this is a polynomial regression, not isotonic on linear. So understate your data first approach. This is the first step ever before you write the code. <coughs> what you can do? You can, uh, who is familiar with R language? Okay, I see I see a couple. <laughs> One time, please. Okay, so R language is a language created by a statistician and physician. Uh, this is a language where you can apply different uh, statistic operation. And for this language, there is a bunch of ready to use and fantastic libraries. And also there is a great ID called Air Studio, uh, and you can visualize your data set in, let's say, in one minute. Of course, <laughs> if your data set is not, uh, it's not so huge. So maybe sometimes, if you know that you need to understand your data, maybe your data set, maybe our data set is appropriate. Maybe something is missing, like information about the size of the city for the developer. And yeah, in this case, yeah, this is the difference. The city is over two times bigger than this one. So in this case, this parameter has huge impact on the salary. In most scenario, in most machine learning scenario, you need to identify which parameters has an impact for another. If you've got some uh, correlated linear correlate, correlated uh, parameters, you need to remove one of them. This is your job as a developer. You need to prepare the, 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 the program which will prepare this data. <coughs> so for example, there's another set of algorithms uh, you can use to, uh, to identify which parameters has the most important for your classification. Okay, if we've got this, this data set with developers, uh, what kind of other machine learning algorithms we can apply? For example, we can use uh, a K-means algorithm. Who is familiar with K-means? Okay, <laughs> I see not so many people, but okay. What is the K-means? Um, if you would like to cluster your data, because this is a clustering algorithm, uh, if you would like to cluster your data, an automatic way. For example, if you would like to find a junior developers in your data set or senior developers, or you would like to uh, find a developers who would like to change the job. It's for <laughs> human resources, a uh, very interesting topic. For example, you can use uh, a chemist algorithms. And 
do me a favor and read about the, 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 the K-means algorithm today or tomorrow in work because it's extremely useful algorithm in many, many cases. If you would like to, to if you search for this, you will probably see an uh, eight years old data set called IRIS created by Ronald Fisher, a uh, biology guy. This data set is uh, heavily used for showing the, 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 the core of KMIS algorithms. So this data set contains 150 uh, rows, vectors of the numbers with four features, the sepal length, sepal width, and sepal height, uh, sepal length, petal length, and petal uh, width. And then you've got the information that this particular row is connected with flower, with iris flower called Setosa versicolor or Virginica. 150 rows. It's uh, not big data, it's a small data, very, very small, pico data, right? On, on the four, four uh, features. And imagine that you need to prepare a classifier. So if you create, if you, if you provide a different and another row, because you find a flower and you would like to know which flower is it, it's a Setosa versicolor virginica, you can use your software just measure the, 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 the petal and sepal width and height and check your software. So before you start, as I said, you, you need to understand your data. You can apply the <coughs> exploratory analysis, for example, a scatter plot. This scatter plot was created with R, with R Studio. And now you see that <sighs> you've got perfectly separated cluster. Okay, then you can compare with this, and then you can create a, a classifier. During, if you perform exploratory analysis, maybe with some scatter plots, you will be able to see that in some conditions, your data is, or data are, separated. Maybe not in this case, but too, yeah, it's separated. Okay, let's jump into the code one more time. Scikit library for Python. Just import the, 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 the KMIS algorithm and run this algorithm. How this algorithm works? Just run this algorithm with cl three clusters. How do I know that I need to run with three clusters from exploratory analysis? How this algorithm works? Imagine that these data are not clustered. In the first step, you need to choose three, because you, you need to classify, uh, you, you need to cluster with three different clusters. Take, let's say, this one this one, and this one. It will be your centroids. So the first step is choose the centroids. In the second step, s check every single point of your data set and assign this particular point to the nearest centroid. This will, it will be the first classification, the first clustering. And then for every single cluster, try to find a center and move the centroid a little bit and perform this algorithm one more time. Check every single point for your data and assign to the nearest centroid. After a few iterations, how many iterations? After a few iterations, this, this clustering will be stable and you can stop your algorithm. Uh, so this is, this is only an example, but okay. I think this is a perfectly separated this is a perfectly separated. Maybe here there is a problem. I don't know. But from the code, it's one more time. It's only a single line where I can create an object, pff, inject data, and start the algorithm. I don't need to implement. So <coughs> in our scenario, uh, this is a cluster for the user who are not interested in changing the job. This is a cluster of the users who would like to change a job. And this is a <laughs> greenfield zone. <laughs> I think in, in most projects, we can identify different tasks, different questions to our data, to our software, for our business, uh, where the machine learning, one of the machine learning tasks would be extremely, believe me, extremely helpful. But in the previous example, we've got the problem with overfitting and the underfitting. In this algorithm, we've got another problem. 
the stability of the results. This algorithm rely on the first step. If you choose as a centroid this one, this one, and this one, randomly taken, the classification will be completely broken. So understand your data first, understand your result. Maybe not first, but <laughs> you need to perform this step. Understand your result, check the performance of the result. The performance and the accuracy of the classification in the project I mentioned um, with links was 94%. 94%. And for the client, was, it was absolutely OK. 100% is, I think, you can't achieve it. For some other class, like classification, you can use the fast um, artificial neural networks. Uh, did you saw today a very popular link called a quick draw? Quick draw dot with uh, google.com. You can check it. This is an uh, uh, application created by Google, uh, published, I think, today or yesterday, where you can draw anything you would like, anything you want. And the neural network behind this, 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 this website, the, this application, uh, will guess what you draw. Uh, and you can spend one hour <laughs> drawing everything you want. Please check it. Uh, Quickdraw.withgoogle.com, I think. So in our case, for example, we can use this, this particular algorithm to find a junior or senior developer or any other, so to answer any other question where the core is classification. How it works? We've got the input layer when we can inject our features. We've got the output layer when, we've, when we check the results. And we've got uh, hidden layers inside where the, uh, the machine learning uh, is working. This machine learning is trying to, to not trying, uh, He's working on, on checking how, how, what is the impact for every single um, decision on the output from, from the input. <coughs> and you need to identify how many different hidden layers you need to use, how many uh, input layers, and how many inputs we've got, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, for the code, one more time, it's rather, rather uh, short. But sometimes you've got a lot of different arguments. And of course, in some algorithms, you need to know how it works um, underneath. Because for, um, this, this, uh, this classifier, this, this neural network classifier, uh, can be useful or useless. Depends on the parameters you will use to train this model. So no matter what kind of technology you are using uh, on your on your project. If you are a C++ developer, Java developer, uh, Python developer, or whatever, there is a bunch ready to use libraries. Like, if you are, who is the Python developer? Okay, are you familiar with Scikit? If not, please check it. Scikit is a, a set of tools ready to use for some classification, regression, dimensionality reduction, clustering, et cetera, et cetera, with a lot of different um, Algorithms already implemented. Some algorithms are used, uh, are ready to use with some um, performance uh, fixes, oh, let's say this way, like SGD, stochastic gradient descent tools, and things like that. So if you are a C developer, there's MLPack or the Shark. If you are a Java developer, there's a bunch of tools like Deep Learning, uh, Spark. Spark is a Hadoop on steroids. There is a, a MLLib model implemented on Spark when you can use all the regression uh, algorithms uh, to, to, for example, to predict probability of different behavior, different events if, if in, in your software. Um, in one project, we use the, 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 the Apache Spark with Apache Cassandra and all the Apache, Sp Apache Hadoop stack to predict the probability of the click in advertisement network. For example, if we've got, it was a real project, we've got 25 million users every single month, and we've got 10 million of items and 1 million of advertisements. For you, as a user, what we need to show you? 
I think the elements uh, where the probability of your click is the biggest. So how we can check it? So we can create a machine learning model uh, which will be ready to classify and predict uh, the probability of click in every single link, depending on another features. And checking and seeking and collecting the, the, the features you need to inject into the machine learning algorithms. Yeah, this is the hardest part in machine learning. Not running the algorithm, not selecting the algorithm, collecting the data, cleaning the data, choosing what should be injected in the model and not should be injected. I said that I've got some, uh, I use the R language. Our language is extremely, the, the syntax is awful, <laughs> believe me, but the language is uh, extremely powerful. And for example, for this language, there is a library called Caret. It's a short for classification and regression training. The Caret library is a unified interface for, I think, 150 different machine learning models. So imagine what kind of powerful tool you've got. Few functions to run 150 different algorithms. So in one project, we use the carrot, and then we use a different, uh, different models to check which, uh, the for, for looking, we are looking for the, uh, the best model, which model offers the best performance in our scenario. So of course, there is another, another set of questions. If I've got uh, algorithms implemented, if I know how can I can prepare my data set, how can I test it? How can I use unit test for some machine learning algorithms? In some scenarios, you can't. Uh, in some scenarios, you can use a different approach. For example, you can split your initial data set in, in supervised learning into, let's say, into the group two groups. You can use 60% of your data to train the model, and you can use the 40% of your data to check if this model performs very, very well. If not, you can tune it. Uh, yeah, checking the, the accuracy and the performance or uh, the model on machine learning techniques where you use the unsupervised uh, techniques, it's a little bit tricky. <laughs> the same as reinforcement learning. If you use uh, the, the card and the R itself is a really, really nice uh, starting point for using a machine learning. You can implement a proof of concept of your solution in, believe me, in one day, uh, where you can start. If you are no Coursera on Udacity, there is a bunch of tools, bunch of courses, open free, where you can learn these techniques. And uh, in Wrocław, there is also a Wrocław Data Science Group, right? The, the open meetup for people interested in these topics. And this topic is, uh, th this meetup is organized by, by the guy with 15 years of experience with R in the banking industry. For example, you can use this R language and R language libraries like Caret uh, to create web application for online analytics. You can use the R language on the server and use the R language not on the front end, but to prepare the front end layer and this part will be compiled to the jQuery and you will get the online analytics application in 20 lines of code. Or if you would like, you can use the R Apache to provide, for example, <laughs> a machine learning API for your, for your project. Okay, <laughs> we used even different approach. We demonized R application on the server, on production server, and our application used the R client to connect with the R software on the server to classify the data. And the performance of this solution was absolutely okay. So as you see, the many different solutions uh, for every single for every single uh, language, you can find a bunch of other libraries to, to solve the machine learning task. So don't focus on the tools; focus on ideas, because probably tools will change. And <laughs> ideas, <laughs> we are using the data set eight years old. Eight years. 
Okay, um, <clears throat> how to start with machine learning? Um, if you know something about what kind of different task you can perform, you need to ask what kind of task I have. This is a regression, classification, clustering, dimensionality reduction problem. This is the first thing you need to do. What kind of task I need to solve? And then, for example, you can use this. This is a scikit learning cheat sheet. Very limited, <laughs> because the full version is a little bit <laughs> with, with extra questions. Because sometimes the algorithm you need to choose or technique you need to choose depends, for example, how many features you've got. How many, what is your, your, what is your size, what is your data um, input your data size? If you've got the size with, let's say, 1,000 uh, items, 1,000 1, observation, you can use a different techniques in, in, in comparison to the situation when you've got 1 million of items. Sometimes the more data is not, uh, doesn't provide to the, to the best solutions. Sometimes you need to reject some of your data before you fit your model. So, <coughs> as you see, I don't, I don't show you a lot of code. The, sh the, the code I show you was just a few lines. But the, 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 the everything around, yeah, this is, this is uh, really important. Because if you would like to, to remember something from the situation, Remember this slide. The machine learning is not single one of any algorithm. It's not about the algorithm. It's about the building process. It's about the building machine learning pipeline. So what is the machine learning pipeline? This is a typical machine learning pipeline. The first, you need to define your model, uh, <laughs> define your problem, sorry. Uh, I mean that you've got some data and you've got some questions, probably from a business. And then you need to check if your data are useful in this context of the questions. If you are know the problem, you, are, you, you, you probably know what kind of machine learning task you can use. It's a classification, regression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then you need to analyze your data, understand your data. So you need to prepare some, um, some uh, exploratory analysis and things like that. If you know your data, there's another step before you inject into the model or train the model. It's a preparation. Let's go back to, to this example with these uh, with this links. You've got two pages. One with 10 links linking to my website and another with five links linking to my website. Which is better? It's hard to say. Why? Because maybe on this page there's another 10,000 links. And on this page, maybe there are other 20 links. So this page will be better, even if the number of the links is a little bit lower. And this is a real case. We found this, uh, we found a, a, a pages with 50,000 of links. So instead of injecting the numbers, how many different links you've got on this page, you need to prepare this data a little bit better. For example, what is the overall percent, percentage of the links linking to my website? So this is a scaling right now, okay? This is scaling, the, 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 every, single, um, the every single value will be from zero to one. And then you can compare. You can compare five links to 100 links. So there is a, another bunch of algorithms just only for the data preparation. And the scikit has uh, <laughs> most of them already implemented. Okay, when you've got your data prepared and you understand your data and your data is cleaned and everything, then you then choose the model and train your data. And maybe there is now, there is a step for some tuning. How many different layers in my neural network should I use? Maybe with some different uh, arguments for the random forest algorithm. Random forest is an extremely useful algorithm. If you are, if you are familiar with a website uh, called kegel.com, this is a <laughs> data science uh, website where you can uh, 
check your skills to solve some, some problems with machine learning, the random forest algorithms is the uh, first choice there. Random forest is algorithm who will be able to create a set of decisions tree. Decisions tree, every single decision tree will be a little bit different with different parameters, with different um, uh, features. And if you, uh, um, if you are uh, asking your model prepared with, machine, uh, with random forest algorithm behind, there is a voting. And uh, every single decision tree is asked, okay, what is your decision for this classification for this data? And the overall uh, result is taken from the majority of your data, the random forest. In our library, there is uh, <laughs> only a, a different model passed in the, in the argument to method, to method called train. Sometimes during a machine learning pipeline, you will create not one, but let's say, 20 different models with different parameters, with different uh, options, maybe with some boost and things like that. Okay, then you need to choose which is the better for this particular case. And then you can create a validation. I mean, what is the overall and final performance for this, for this, for this model? And this is uh, iteration. And then you, if you've got in extra data, if you've got the data uh, fixed and corrected by a user, you need to take an iteration. Maybe, maybe from this step. So uh, from my perspective and the projects I, I was involved, this steps, this step, the step when you prepare your data from the machine learning process, this is the most important step. If you create a data set not so carefully, all the rest is a shit, to be honest. And there is a perfect, uh, perfect use case from one project from, uh, from uh, uh, Silicon Valley, where one team was prepared, uh, was working on the uh, text recognition from the image. And six guys, I think, spent almost one year on fixing this step to, to provide a little bit better accuracy on the full algorithm. They spent almost one year, and the <laughs> difference in accuracy was less than half of percent. Less than half of percent. Why? Because the problem was located here. The data collected uh, and injected to the model was not so good. <laughs> Let's say this, not so good. So, um, okay, we are going to finish. So let's take a look on this side. We've got the age, we've got the information about the city size, we've got the number of confirmation, and finally we've got the salary, because this is an argument, this is a feature, and we would like to predict. And in this case, no matter how many LinkedIn confirmations you will get, no matter how good your data set is, one information is missing. <laughs> the currency. If you omit this case, all the data set is broken. Think for a, for a while about it. And of course, um, if you'd like to start with machine learning, go Coursera and spend <laughs> four hours a week and get new skills. And you, you will see that a lot of business problems a lot of, believe me, a lot of business problems are ready to use with machine learning. So, uh, from my side, it's, uh, it's all. <laughs> if you've got some questions, uh, I will be able to, to, to reply. If you would like to ask me uh, on the corridor, uh, please find me. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariusz. And before the start of the discussion, please correct me if I'm wrong. So, we have to define the problem, mm -hmm. prepare the data, and we don't need any Maciej Wróżbita comes to you <laughs> and you will predict my future, right? Uh, it, it depends what kind of uh, future you would like to, to predict. <laughs> you know, the crucial for me, that's when Polish football team win Mundial. 
It's a real problem. I can answer without the marshmallow. I can. <laughs> okay, so I open a discussion. The first question. Uh, can you give an, an example um, of a state of data where uh, one parameter is uh, not missing but is distorting the data? Uh, you mean that one parameter creates a distortion? Yeah. Yeah, you know, this is a part of the, 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 the initial phase. You need to identify uh, this parameter and some algorithms will be ready to identify this algorithm. If you've got some distortions, uh, you probably need to remove this parameter as well as you would like to, to remove the, let's say, uh, parameters which are correlated perfectly with each other. Okay, for example, we, you've got the <coughs> information, you would like to predict area of the square. So, for example, you've got the information about the, the, the this, um, uh, this edge or this edge. Okay, so the size of our area is perfectly correlated with these parameters. So, uh, during the, 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 the initial phase of analyzing the data, you need to find the correlation and remove some parameters which are correlated or uh, uncorrelated perfectly from the data set and then remove them and inject the final smallest data set into the machine learning model. In R, there are a bunch of ready to use functions for that. You need to just apply on the initial data set. Uh, if you would like, what kind of task machine learning can perform? So please uh, check this uh, quick draw dot with google dot com and you will be able. What kind of task uh, the neural networks can solve? The other said, uh, as you said, there is a huge problem to prepare data for, uh, to teach uh, uh, machine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why there is a new approach to to machine learning, like uh, uh, deep learning methods, like deep neural networks, etc. Uh, it I'm not using a deep neural networks yet. So <laughs> probably can't yeah, answer. But, uh, it, it is supported by uh, this uh, tool that you mm -hmm. uh, show in the presentation. It is supported by this uh, Python library. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that not. I, I'm not using a deep learning yet, so so I can even uh, tell you what kind of algorithm, what kind of library you can use in Python. For Java, yeah, there is uh, a lot of uh, algorithms and, and libraries uh, for that. I, I, I miss this, um, this library created by the Google, uh, but it's for Java, I think. Huh. Hmm? Yeah, TensorFlow, that's right, but it's for Java. For Python also? Okay, I remember the first version. <laughs> Thanks. So. Okay, so if you've got questions more, so please hit me here. So. Okay, and we are now we are closing our discussion. So go to the break. <laughs>